Good morning. So welcome to the 24th Mental Health Services Research Conference. Welcome in person and online. Um, on behalf of the co-chairs and NIMH, uh, we're thrilled to have yet another record-breaking turnout. A few announcements before jumping in. Um, all sessions are going to be webcasted for live and post-conference viewing. Some late-breaking news. We're exploring outlets for publication of conference presentations, and we'll contact presenters uh, at a later date with some more information about that. With our packed conference schedule, we really need your help um, to ensure presentations run smoothly. So if you can see at the top here, we have green lights, yellow lights, and red lights. Just try to respect the clock as best as you can. Um, we know that there are a lot of exciting talks. And please be sure to attend the poster sessions today and tomorrow. Uh, they're hard to miss, and we've deliberately set, that out, set it up that way, so when you walk out, you'll run into them. Uh, today for presenters, uh, for investigators, and tomorrow is for new investigators. So I'm sure poster presenters would love to uh, talk with you and, and hear some feedback. Um, also, for the presenters, just be sure to upload your talks. And maybe most importantly, uh, coffee and lunch. Um, two coffee stations will be available for purchase, uh, and lunch there will be a nice buffet, uh, actually right next door, for purchase as well. There are other lunch options um, listed in your uh, packets. So uh, to model uh, an acceptance award for the upcoming Emmys, um, let me start with some sincere thank yous. So thank you to the research community, the practice community, our public and private partners, mental health advocates, people with lived experience, and other consumers of science for your interest and passion for mental health services research. To our external co-chairs, Drs. Renad Betis and Michael Compton sitting up front, thank you for your scientific direction, review of abstracts, and selection of keynote and plenary talks. And also thank you to the NIMH Travel Office, uh, Penny Kisner and Heather Coulter in particular, whose bureaucratic prowess uh, really streamlined the approval process for this conference and helped us deal with some last minute hiccups. I would like to thank our colleagues from the Office of Science Policy, Planning, and Communications, especially Natalie Ziegler uh, for the conference PR and some live tweets that are gonna be happening throughout the conference and photographs, um, and also to disseminate information about the conference. And to our longevity co contractors and Marriott staff who are operating uh, behind the scenes and are largely invisible, but are really doing a lot of the heavy lift with, with logistics. And, and to the services research and clinical epidemiology branch, especially my co-chair, Denise Giuliani, Gi Giuliano Bolt. Uh, without your assistance with abstract review, uh, helping to shape events and help with all those last minute details, this conference certainly would not happen. Um, so I'd like to actually introduce the branch so you know who your program officers are and uh, their, their program areas of science. Um, so if folks could please stand up. Uh, Dr. Susan Azarin manages our premature, reducing premature mortality in people with a serious mental illness portfolio as well as early psychosis. Denise Giuliano Bolt, right up front. Uh, who manages our health systems research portfolio, health disparities research portfolio, and autism spectrum disorder for transition age youth and adults portfolio. Dr. Agnes Rupp, where's Agnes, there she is, um, manages our methods portfolio and our financing uh, uh, portfolio. And Dr. Denise Pintello, Denny Pintello, where are you, in the back there, uh, manages uh, most of our DNI portfolio, uh, children's services portfolio, uh, as well as our autism spectrum disorder for children portfolio. Uh, also like to thank the newest member of our team, um, Gretchen Navidi, right up front here, uh, who's assigned to our division, um, but we welcome her into our branch for all and all her help. Um, and would also like to thank Janet Sorrells, uh, whose help was instrumental for many previous conferences and who's been out on medical leave since June, uh, will not able to join us today. Uh, we do miss you, Janet. So much has happened in the past two years. You may have heard that NIMH has a different director, not a new director anymore because he's now been here two years. And you may have seen his uh, recent director's message about services research. You'll hear more from Dr. Gordon later in a pre-recorded message, 
but you can see how much of a priority services research is uh, to the Institute. Technical challenges. There we go. So NAMH funded. Um, you'll see that NAMH uh, also issued several funding announcements. Uh, the Alacrity Centers uh, program is intended to support research that demonstrates an extraordinary level of synergy across disciplines and has a high potential for increasing the public health impact of existing and emerging, emerging mental health treatments and service deliveries. We funded several so far, and we're excited for, for uh, the new applications that have yet to come. We have parent announcements that, more technical difficulties, there we go. Um, so these parent-like parent, these parent -like FOAs um, round out our pilot and fully powered clinical trials and non-clinical trial research portfolio. We also have a notice of intent to publish for an open competition practice-based research network. And for those of you who have seen it, and see the anticipated March 2018 publication date, uh, that has passed, but we still intend to publish. <laughs> Among, and we also have uh, a slew of other portfolio uh, funding announcements. So since 2014, NAMH has required investigators to be more explicit about mechanism in clinical trial research. And language embedded in all of our funding announcements um, requires uh, uh, informa investigators to put in information about these mechanisms. So there's merit to knowing whether an intervention worked or not. Um, but it's also important to know how it works. And this allows for more thoughtful adaptations uh, should, should an intervention be implemented uh, allows for more thoughtful optimization or retooling if the intervention doesn't work. And so really the experimental therapeutics paradigm is about understanding how an intervention works. I'd also like to uh, uh, send a nod out to our colleagues at the Department of Veterans Affairs and, Depar and uh, 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 Department of Defense. This is sort of an underpublicized under event, but collaborative care now is recommended in the VA DOD clinical practice guidelines. And this is important because in my um, more than cursory but non-exhaustive search of US-based clinical practice guidelines, collaborative care is notably absent, despite overwhelming evidence. And We need to fix this uh, technical challenges here. So you can see that for depression, not surprisingly, a strong four, and for PTSD, a weak four. But the reviewers also looked at other trials that were up and coming. So we know that with overwhelming evidence, moving research to practice is really, really hard. And sometimes this takes an act of Congress. And so for folks familiar with the 21st Century Cures Act, in it um, is standing up the uh, Interdepartmental uh, Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee with SAMHSA as the lead. Uh, work has begun with representatives across multi multiple uh, government departments to include Department of Justice, Housing and Urban Development, uh, Veterans Affairs, Department of Defense. Um, and these, are all, these departments are all working with Health and Human Services to include CMS, NIMH, and others. And you can see this is really to improve care for people with serious mental illness uh, and children and transition age youth with social emotional disturbance. There are five priority areas that you can see about uh, strengthening federal coordination, access and engagement to care, treatment and recovery services, uh, opportunities for jail diversion and improved care for people with SMI and SED in the criminal justice system, as well as financing. And these areas align closely to, the, to our branches program areas, so they're very important. A couple weeks ago, uh, as part of one of the recommendations 3.8, uh, 
uh, there was the first of many meetings to start talking about setting a research priority agenda uh, for people with SED and SMI. Aside from an act of Congress, which doesn't happen too often, sometimes it takes a lot of intense listening uh, to the research needs of healthcare beneficiaries, and this is part of a learning healthcare system. NIMH, the prototype for this that NIMH supports is the Mental Health Research Network. Um, and this is priority population-based research uh, in about 13 different healthcare systems serving 12 and a half million beneficiaries uh, across the country. And there are a variety of different studies that really address uh, high priority areas, uh, both to the institute and to these beneficiaries. But sometimes, you know, that we don't have a partnership with the whole healthcare system. Um, sometimes it takes partnership with the right professional organization whose recommendation has weight um, and carries with it uh, incentives to, to do what's recommended and disincentives for not doing what's recommended. And an example of this is some work from Doug Zatzik and colleagues um, who have a partnership with the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma so that their work directly informs trauma, uh, the, this committee's recommendations, and the recommendations uh, carry weight to the practice community. And sometimes we don't know how or, or if or our message is heard by key decision makers. And so what do we do? We ask them, right? This is a nice, ele small, elegant study by Jonathan Pertle. And the goal is to improve the dissemination of evidence about comprehensive state mental health uh, parity legislation, evidence-based treatment, and mental health uh, mental illness to state policymakers. And finally, perhaps we need a little science to nudge people in the right direction, but also bring people together uh, and to help them participate in the decisions that are being made about them. And so we're thrilled to have Renad Betis as one of our co-chairs, um, who's uh, a, a PI along with David Mandel and Kevin Volpe, uh, one of our alacrity centers. And this is a marriage of implementation science and behavioral economics. Uh, there are three pilot projects really operate at three different levels, at the patient level, the provider level, uh, and the healthcare leader level uh, to help uh, move uh, evidence into practice. So NIMH remains committed uh, to, our, uh, to our core tenets of services research, which include access, continuity, quality, equity, and value. Um, we do this through federal partnerships. We have one with HRSA now to help implement collaborative care. Uh, and we know that our research findings have, uh, are of little value if they don't make their way into practice. Um, so you can see this in our strategic research priorities, which are updated yearly. Um, and as evident in the theme of this meeting, we want your ideas. We want your new ideas. We want to see the next generation of, of research. So our work continues, as do our opening remarks. Um, so to talk about NAMH's investment in new ideas and other things too, I'd like to welcome our co-chair, Denise Juliana Bolt. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have, this morning I have two tasks, thanking people and introducing people, and so I'm going to start with thanking people. Uh, I think I need to do this with my glasses. First, I want to thank all of the people who served as reviewers in our presentation selection process. This includes folks internal to and external to NIMH. While we've been very happy about the very large response that we got to our call for abstracts, in fact, the largest ever number of abstracts received for this meeting, so you really like us. <laughs> That response also created a new high for workload in terms of evaluating the abstracts, paper, or poster, symposia, and plenary presentations. Um, and among those abstracts, we were also very happy to see submissions from familiar places, uh, faces, our grantees who we've worked with and known over the years, and also from some new researchers. That's the thing that keeps our research going. Um, so for all those who volunteered their expertise in assessing submissions, I thank you for meeting and in some cases coming in ahead of the deadline we had for getting the scoring in and for helping us ensure the high quality and relevance of the conference presentations. 
In addition, we want to thank the folks who responded to our call for a special set of abstracts related to the conference theme this year. In prior years, we've asked conference participants for feedback on how the scientific presentations might inform future NIMH activities. This year, we made more concrete and hopefully accelerated that forward-looking process by directly soliciting abstracts for presentations describing your ideas about what might be the next big thing in mental health services and services research. Happily, we received so many creative and thoughtful submissions in this category that we ended up including two plenary sessions, one today and one tomorrow, uh, to present those that were selected. It's our hope that during those sessions, there will be active participation from you all in the audience that will generate even more ideas uh, about how the research we support can continue to be on the cutting edge in improving all kinds of health outcomes for people with severe mental illness. And finally, in my thank you section, uh, on behalf of the Services Research and Clinical Epidemiology Branch, I want to thank our branch chief, Mike Freed, for his leadership in the planning of this meeting, and especially for being so even-keeled, open to new ideas, and a good decision maker in times of duress that sometimes cropped up during the conference development process. So thank you. So, moving on to the introduction section, I'll start with our external co-chairs, and you'll be hearing from them throughout the meeting. First, Dr. Michael Compton, who is Medical Director for Adult Services at the New York State Office of Mental Health and Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Prior to joining OMH in Columbia, he served as, <coughs> excuse me, tenured, uh, associate professor at Emory University, professor and director of research initiatives in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at George Washington University School of Medicine, chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Lenox Hill Hospital, and professor of psychiatry at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. Dr. Compton has maintained continuous NIMH research funding for more than 15 years, conducting research on a variety of service challenges faced by people with severe mental illness, including studies of collaboration and linkage between law enforcement and mental health systems, first episode psychosis, and recovery-oriented community navigation for persons with SMI who have repeated hospitalizations. Our other co-chair is Dr. Renad Betas, Assistant Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry at the Perelman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, and uh, she's also the Director of Implementation Research at the Center for Mental Health Policy and Services Research at Penn. Uh, in addition, she's a senior fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute. She's been identified as one of the top 10 implementation science experts nationally, and her work has been funded by NIH continuously since 2012. Her research focuses on the dissemination and implementation of evidence-based practices for youth with psychiatric disorders in community settings. She partners with community stakeholders to understand the optimal implementation of EBPs and to improve children's mental health services across a variety of settings. So we thank you both for being with us through the planning of this and now being a bit big part of the implementation of this uh, meeting. So now to segue to our first presentation, which is from the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, Dr. Joshua Gordon. Dr. Gordon sends his requests, that, uh, his regrets that he can't be here, so he has sent his remarks virtually in a video cast. So if our technology is ready to do so, here's Welcome, Josh. everyone. We're delighted to have you join us virtually and in person for the 24th NIMH Conference on Mental Health Services Research. Unfortunately, I'm not able to attend in person this year, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to acknowledge NIMH's appreciation of the cutting edge research you're conducting and using to improve the lives of people with mental illnesses. NIMH envisions a world in which mental illnesses are prevented and cured. To this end, we invest in basic research to understand the mechanisms and origins of mental illnesses. 
as well as translational research to develop novel treatments and prevention measures based on this understanding. But as you all know, research doesn't stop with the discovery of a new treatment, because even the best treatment won't work if people can't or won't use it. We therefore also need research to figure out how best to deliver effective therapies and services. The presentations over the next two days will highlight scientific findings from services research studies intended to improve the organization, delivery, quality, and outcomes of mental health care, and to help currently available effective treatments reach those individuals who need it now. We're happy to note that this year, we've received the largest number of abstracts ever submitted to the conference. This enabled us to showcase high-quality, cutting-edge mental health services research in the panel and symposium sessions. Soon, you'll hear from one of our invited speakers, Judge Stephen Leifman, an administrative judge for the 11th Judicial Circuit Court of Florida. Judge Leifman is the gatekeeper to the largest psychiatric facility in the state, the Miami-Dade County Jail. He'll share with you the challenges he faced in creating the groundbreaking Criminal Mental Health Project and Mental Health Jail Diversion Facility, and his thoughts on how research can inform, support, and spread the implementation of programs that are effective in improving outcomes for people with mental illnesses who have become involved in the criminal justice system. You'll also hear from Dr. Jurgen Unitzer, who will deliver the inaugural Wayne Caton Memorial Lecture. Dr. Unitzer is professor and chair in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington. And he led the development and testing of a collaborative care model for depression that is now implemented in more than a thousand primary care clinics. His lecture, Translating Research into Practice, The Case for Collaborative Care, will cover the history and potential future implications for the use of the collaborative care model. This year, we also invited you to share your vision of the near-term future of mental health services research. What might be the next big thing in improving care delivery and shaping the future service delivery landscape? Prepare yourself to be challenged, excited, and inspired in innovative new directions. Before I hand things off to the next speaker, once again, I want to say on behalf of the NIMH, welcome. It's encouraging to know that so many of you are contributing to our goal of improving outcomes for people with mental illnesses. I'm going to move into our next session, which has uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Compton and Judge Steve Leifman. Good morning. I'm Michael Compton. I'm one of the co-chairs of this year's NIMH Mental Health Services Research Conference. Mike, Denise, Renaud, and I welcome you all to the, to the meeting this year. This morning, um, it's my great honor to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, Judge Steve Leifman. As I am someone conducting research at the interface between the criminal justice system and serious mental illnesses, Judge Leifman is one of my heroes, and he's a hero to the field. Judge Leifman is the Associate Administrative Judge of the Miami-Dade County Courts Criminal Division. From 2007 to 2010, Judge Leifman served as Special Advisor on Criminal Justice and Mental Health for the Supreme Court of Florida. Judge Leifman currently chairs the Florida Supreme Court's Task Force on Substance Abuse and mental health issues in the court, and he chairs the Mental Health Committee for the 11th Judicial Circuit of Florida. <laughs> Judge Leifman received the 2015 William Rehnquist Award for Judicial Excellence. This is one of the nation's highest judicial honors presented by Chief Justice John Roberts. The Rehnquist Award is presented annually to a state court judge who exemplifies judicial excellence integrity, fairness, and professional ethics. Judge Leifman is also the first recipient of the Florida Supreme Court's Chief Justice Award for Judicial Excellence. That was in 2015. More recently, 
Judge Leifman was named by New Times as one of Miami-Dade's most interesting people of 2017. And he was named a 2016 Governing Magazine Public Official of the Year. The, he was one of eight honorees for that award, which recognizes governmental leaders who exemplify the ideals of public service. Judge Leifman has been featured in many national and local television programs, radio programs, articles about mental illnesses in the criminal justice system, including the New England Journal of Medicine, The Atlantic Magazine, CBS News, USA Today, CNN with Anderson Cooper, the NBC Nightly News, NPR's All Things Considered, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and many other venues. He's also authored many um, articles and book chapters on mental illnesses and the criminal justice system. Now, in addition to all of these remarkable professional accomplishments, Judge Leifman possesses personal virtues that make him deserving of those countless accolades. He's kind, trustworthy, generous, and caring. And perhaps most importantly, he cares about people with serious mental illnesses. And he shows deep compassion regarding the situations they all too commonly find themselves in. He mightily and courageously pursues a bold mission to improve mental health services for people with serious mental illnesses, which must be accomplished in part by reforming the criminal justice system. What a delight to have the judge with us this morning. Please join me in welcoming Judge Steve Leifman. Good morning, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And Michael, thank you so much for that incredibly thoughtful introduction. And I want to thank you for your interest in the intersection between mental health and criminal justice, and also to really thank you for the tremendous work you do for our nation in this field. When I was 17 years old, I was an aide to a legislator in Miami, and I was an intern, and he received a letter from the then editor of the Miami Herald about a young man who was at our local state psychiatric hospital, and they weren't sure he needed to be there. And so being the lowest person on the totem pole, I was selected to go to the state hospital to check out the situation. I grew up in a nice middle class family. I never saw anything bad in my life until I walked into this house of horror. You see, my age directly corresponds to the deinstitutionalization movement in this nation. And so I've seen the changes go on from a very unique and different perspective. So I walked into the hospital that morning and I found the young man. He was in a bed. He was in all four point restraints. He was probably 100 pounds overweight from the Thorazine he was being injected with. And he was moaning and crying and screaming, living in his own personal hell. After doing a little bit of research, it turned out that he wasn't even psychotic, he was autistic. While I was there, I guess uh, not too many representatives from the legislature came visiting to state hospitals. And so it turned out there was an advocate at the facility that day, and they asked if I would go on a tour of the hospital. They took me downstairs to what I still remember looked like a dungeon, where I found seven men lying naked in their own feces while a guard stood there and hosed them down. And this is why we shut down those horrible houses of horror. What I didn't know, though, was 17 years later, when I became a judge, I would witness the same horrors that I saw in that hospital 17 years earlier in my own local jail. And as Dr. Gordon mentioned, I had no idea I was going to become the gatekeeper to the largest psychiatric facility in Florida, the Miami-Dade County Jail. While the United States has 5% of the world's population, we have 25% of the world's inmates. Think about that for a moment. So as you're sitting here this morning, 
understand that one out of 104 adults in the United States are behind bars. One out of 33 adults in the United States are under correctional supervision. Since 1980, the number of people going to jail has tripled and their sentences have increased by 166%. And as you drill down deeper, you peel back that onion to try to figure out what in the heck has happened, what you will understand is most of this is due to untreated mental illnesses and substance use disorders. In fact, people with mental illnesses in the United States are nine times more likely to be incarcerated than hospitalized. They are 18 times more likely to find a bed in the criminal justice system than at any state civil hospital. Annually, we have more than two million people with serious mental illnesses arrested, and on any given day, there are 550,000 people with serious mental illnesses in jail or prison, and another 900,000 under correctional supervision. This is a shameful American tragedy, and it is one that must and can be reversed. Our counties last year spent over 80 billion dollars on correctional costs. It has gotten so bad for counties that they are now having to decide, do I build a new road or a new jail? Do I build a new hospital or a new jail? Do I build a new school or a new jail? Our states are spending another 71 billion dollars for prisons. To put this in some perspective, HUD's entire budget is 47 billion dollars, 30 billion of which goes to housing one-fifth what we're spending on correctional cost in this nation. I'm going to show you a short video that was produced by my local CBS4 affiliate that does a wonderful yet horrifying job describing what is really going on in our jails. Now, live, this is CBS 4 News at 11. Life here is dirty, deplorable, dangerous. I can't read it I can't read it yet. Tonight, CBS 4 takes you to a place cameras are rarely allowed to reveal what's happening in our downtown jail to the inmates on the forgotten floor. The people who spend their days and nights in these jail cells all suffer from mental illness. They're accused criminals, not guilty in the eyes of the law, but forced to live in conditions you cannot imagine. Our chief investigative reporter, Michelle Gillen, has been given unprecedented television access to reveal what's going on. Michelle joins us now, and I was shocked, to say the least, when I saw this. I think certainly it is time for the public to see what is going on. The pictures you are about to see are indeed haunting and most disturbing. Hundreds of men with mental illnesses, many crammed into tiny cells. Some arrested for minor crimes that advocates say would have the average person out of jail in just hours. But incredibly, there is no place to send them. Tonight, our cameras take you inside a world rarely exposed, the forgotten floor. And then they get thrown into a cell. Prison insiders call this the forgotten floor, but it seems unimaginable that the horrendous, be it horrifying conditions of a jail spilling over with inmates suffering from mental illnesses could be erased from any sane man's mind. As frigid air is pumped into sealed cells, some beg for help for the barest of necessities, water. The faucets are dry. The, the, the water's not working. The water's not working. He's drinking sewer water. He's drinking toilet water out of the toilet. We'll get you water. It doesn't work, the faucets. The faucets aren't working. These stench-filled cells were designed for one person, outfitted with only a single steel shelf for a bed. In this one, there's three inmates in a cell for one. Yet two, three, sometimes even five men, diagnosed with mental illnesses, in most cases arrested for low-level felony crimes, in some cases misdemeanors, are locked up for days, weeks, months. Tell me about you. Tell me, uh, living in this, what do you want the public to know tonight? I want the, I want the public to know that the that, that people in here, they're, they're urinating on the floor, and we have to sleep on top of it. 
They're, they're defecating on the floor, and you have to sleep on top of it. There's only one bunk, and it's made of steel. And how many people are in your cell? There is four in here right now. They are only allowed out of their cell for 15 minutes two times a week. 30 minutes a week they're allowed out. So other than a half an hour, that's it. This is it. They right. are in this room. Lights are on 24-7. The conditions you see just do not change. I've been in Vietnam. I've been in Vietnam. I've been in Vietnam. I've been in Vietnam. I wouldn't put a dog in here. A chilling perspective from the jail's chief psychiatrist, Dr. Joseph Portier. You would think that in 2006, we would treat people with chronic mental illness in a much better, more humane manner. But unfortunately, we're reverting back to how it was in the 16 and 1700s, which is terrible. It's morally incomprehensible. A sentiment echoed by an outraged Miami-Dade County judge, Steve Leifman. This is like a secret that people don't yeah, know about. Yeah, it's a bad secret, and it's a sad secret. What most of you don't know is that the Miami-Dade jail now serves as the largest psychiatric facility in the state of Florida. Three of nine floors burgeoning with inmates suffering from mental illnesses and, according to Leifman, in desperate need of treatment not this type of confinement designed to punish people. Five times as many people in our jail with mental illness than any psychiatric hospital in Florida. Five times. In this, right here? Right here. An elderly man emerges from the dirt and darkness. There's one on the floor underneath the bunk and one or two standing around waiting for their turn to sleep. And the crisis has unfolded across the state. In other Florida jails where they strive to comply with all the national standards for housing inmates, frustration over the virtual abandonment of mentally ill inmates left by the state to languish in jail cells for months runs deep. Colonel David Parrish. Can you imagine the chaos that would result in the local criminal justice system if I stood at the booking door and said, sorry, we don't have any more room, we're not yeah. taking them from you, law enforcement? Yeah. Parrish from Hillsborough County says local authorities had no choice but to sue the state of Florida to force the Department of Children and Families to comply with their legal mandate to transfer mentally ill inmates to a treatment facility within 15 days. Jails should not be the de facto mental health facility for a county, but that's what they are in the, in, in the United States. You had your birthday here. How old were you? Uh, I was 21. 21? Yes, ma'am. And you've been here eight months? Yes, ma'am. In Pinellas County, the weight of incarcerating and caring for mentally ill inmates had everyone paying a price, an unacceptable one, according to Major Kirk Brunner. We are not a treatment facility, and these people that you saw in Delta One, the one that plucked his eye out, they need to be in a treatment facility, which is the responsibility of the state, not our responsibility. And therein lies the danger. William Weaver Sr. was caring for his 40-year-old son, Bill, at home. A son, he says, suffered from schizophrenia but functioned well for decades until his medicine was changed. Then one night, according to police records, he attacked his elderly father, who called police and urged them to arrest his son, hoping this would trigger treatment because he was under the false idea that if he got arrested, he'd get treatment. Bill ended up locked up in a cell on floor nine of the Miami-Dade Pretrial Detention Center for several months. According to authorities, Bill jumped from this top bunk bed, cracking his skull and breaking his neck. He's now a quadriplegic who needs hospitalization to stay alive. We met up with his father, who had just left his hospital bed. Do you think anything has come from what the incident of what your son went through? Nothing. Nothing's changed. Do I think something could change? I don't know. I don't know. It's time. It's time something changed. But I don't know if it ever will. Tragically, the young man in the video passed away about two years ago as a result of his injuries. We believe his father passed away about a year later, probably from a broken heart. It took us almost 11 years to close that jail floor, and we have opened a much more appropriate place in our jail for people with mental illnesses, but the 
answer is not to build better jails to house people with serious mental illnesses. The, better, the answer is to build better systems of care in our community so people don't end up in the criminal justice system in conditions like this. And while Miami was horrible, I assure you we're not alone. My journey into the mental health world actually began one morning when I was getting ready to get on the bench. I was approached by <coughs> excuse me, the assistant public defender and the assistant state attorney, and they asked me if I would speak to a couple whose son was in jail on a case I was about to hear. At the time, I was handling what we call a misdemeanor jail division. Those are people that are still in custody on very minor offenses. And there's basically three kinds of people in a misdemeanor jail division. There are those with serious attached felonies who are not allowed to get out. There are those that cannot afford to pay bond and are stuck in jail because of their economics. And then there are those with serious mental illnesses that just don't know how to get out of jail. And this young man was in on a very minor offense. I don't even believe it was a statutory offense. It was a little, little local county ordinance that we call possession of a dairy cart that a lot of homeless people get pulled in on those kinds of charges. It's a way sometimes for the police to street, clean the streets or sometimes for them to try to get people treatment, they think, by getting them arrested. So this lovely couple came into my chambers, very sophisticated and very distraught. The mom was crying, the dad was shaking, and they literally began to beg me to get their son help. They told me that their son was brilliant, he had gone to Harvard, he had a late onset of schizophrenia, and he was now homeless and recycling through the criminal justice system, and they just didn't know what to do. This was in the year 2000, I was a relatively new judge, I was pretty naive. I think when you're a new judge, you think you have a lot more power and a lot more wisdom than you really do. And I made the mistake in my life. I promised them that I would get their son help because, see, I deal in logic, and I knew that if somebody got arrested and they had a heart attack, there was a system of care for them, seamless, and we would take care of them. And so I just assumed that if you got arrested and you had a serious mental illness like schizophrenia, we must have a system of care for, me, for you. So I promised them I would get them help. And as I began to go back into the courtroom, the mom stopped me. And she said, Judge, um, there's one more thing I, I need to tell you about my son. She said, not only is he brilliant, but respectfully, he probably knows more about the mental health system than you do. And I was a little confused, and I said, excuse me? And she said, well, you see, uh, my son is the former head of psychiatry at Jackson Memorial Hospital. He had a late onset of schizophrenia. He was having religious ideations. He cashed in his life insurance policy. He didn't show up to work one day. He got on a plane and he flew to Israel. And within three weeks, the Israelis deported him back to Miami because he was running around naked in the Orthodox section of Jerusalem and he's been homeless ever since. I was pretty taken back. I walked into the courtroom and I called his case, and he stood, and we started to have an amazing conversation. He was thoughtful, he was coherent, he was much more respectful than the lawyers, and I'm thinking, <laughs> man, maybe there's something wrong with his folks, he seems fine to me. Now, mind you, at that time in Florida, judges had absolutely no training on how to identify people with mental illnesses, what to do with people with mental illnesses, and I must say, all of that has changed. But except when I looked at him, he looked like a homeless man that hadn't bathed in months. But he seemed fine. And he kept insisting there was absolutely nothing wrong with him. He had no type of mental health disorder. And if I only released him, he would go see a psychiatrist, he would get evaluated, and he would come back. And as he pointed out, he had already been in jail 10 times longer than anybody else would ever be with such a silly charge. So I asked him, I said, I just don't understand one thing. You keep insisting there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. But if that's the case, why would a Harvard-educated psychiatrist be in jail, be homeless, and be recycling through our criminal justice system? And all of a sudden, he started rocking back and forth. He started cupping his ears, 
and he went into a full-blown psychotic episode, and he started pointing to the back of the courtroom where his parents were standing, and everything he said and yelled were in sixes, and he started screaming at the top of his lungs, Your Honor, Your Honor, Your Honor, you have to have the couple move, you have to have the couple move, you have to have the couple move. I said to him, aren't those your parents? No, 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 real parents, real parents, dead, 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 dead. Holocaust, 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 Holocaust. And they are from the CIA, 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 and they came to kill me, kill me, kill me, kill me, kill me. And the only thing that you could hear in that courtroom at that moment was his poor mother crying. And the only thing I had been taught at that point in my very short judicial career is that if somebody acts strange or bizarre, order a psychological evaluation. I wasn't even sure what I was supposed to do with the evaluation when it came back. I immediately ordered an evaluation. He now was in jail, I don't know, four weeks on possession of a dairy cart. The evaluation came back and it said not only was he incompetent to proceed, but he actually met Florida's very high standard for involuntary hospitalization. Now I will tell you that Florida has a very high standard of uh, um, criteria for involuntary hospitalization, not because we're a great civil libertarian state, but we're cheap bastards. And if we have a really high standard, we don't have to pay for people's services. These are things that need to be studied. Why is every state using a different standard to decide what kind of treatment people need? It's ridiculous. Well, at the time in Florida, you needed three evaluations to get a stipulation by the lawyers, so I had to order two more. I don't know, now he's in jail 10, 12, 12 weeks on possession of a dairy cart, but all three evaluations came back and they said the exact same thing. Not only was he incompetent, but he was imminently dangerous to himself or others and he needed immediate hospitalization. And I'm thinking, this is great. I'm gonna be a hero, I'm gonna get this guy help, I'm never gonna have to deal with mental illness again, and we're all gonna live happily ever after. This is wonderful. I handed the evaluations to the lawyers. They immediately stipulated that he was incompetent to proceed and I began to order him into involuntary hospitalization. And all of a sudden I looked down and I noticed that the assistant public defender was grinning. And I will tell you as a former assistant public defender, it's a really bad sign. <laughs> and then, I don't have any lawyers in here so I may have to explain this to you. She said, then uttered those magic words that can make judges go a little batty. She said to me, your honor, in all due respect, so when a lawyer says that to a judge, it has nothing to do with respect. <laughs> That's how they call us idiots without going to jail. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? And she whipped out this Florida Supreme Court opinion that had actually come out two months earlier. And of course, since I had no training in mental health, I had never seen such an opinion. And what did it say? It said that county court judges, of which I am, have absolutely no legal authority to involuntarily hospitalize anybody and that my only option was to release him back to the street and do exactly what he had told me 10 weeks earlier, tell him to go see a doctor, get evaluated, come back, and then if need be, we can get him restored for competency in the community. That was in January of 2000. I cannot tell you today if he is dead or alive. Even though I did not like the law, I am bound to follow it. I released him back to the street not only f not fulfilling the promise I had made to his parents, but putting him at risk, God forbid something terrible happened to him. I put the community at risk, God forbid he did something to somebody else, and I probably put my job at risk, but I followed the law. And I will tell you, like you, you do, we do not go into these professions to be part of that kind of horrible problem. I went back to my chambers that morning, I was pretty distraught myself, I got on the phone, I started making calls, and I learned three very, very valuable lessons that morning. The first lesson I learned is it turned out Miami-Dade truly has a very serious mental health crisis. It turns out that we are the community with the largest percentage of people with serious mental illnesses of any urban area in the United States. 9.1% of our general population, that's 197,000 adults and 55,000 children, live with great difficulty with very serious mental illnesses and because we are between 49th and 51st per capita in mental health funding, so many of these individuals are ending up in our criminal justice system. At the time, 35% of our inmates were on antipsychotic medication, 
and we were spending $500,000 a day, a day. That's $180 million a year to warehouse people in a hellhole. And that because conditions are not conducive for treatment in our jail and most jails in the United States, people with mental illnesses stay four to eight times longer at seven times the cost for the exact same charge of someone without a mental health disorder. And because we had done a really poor job training our law enforcement officers on how to deal with people with mental illnesses, we had 25 people die during an encounter with a police officer because the police had not been trained. That was my first lesson. The second lesson I learned, this was not just a local problem or a state problem, but in fact a national problem. Former Surgeon General David Satcher called mental illness the silent epidemic of our time. I tell you, if you work in the criminal justice system, there's absolutely nothing silent about the epidemic. We hear their screams, we see their cries every single day. And the third lesson, and maybe the most difficult lesson that I learned that day, is that our community mental health system, our crisis system and laws, they are antiquated, they are fragmented, they do not reflect modern science and medical research and practices, and they are in need of great, great reform. I've been doing this now for almost 18 years, and I've come to one very simple conclusion, that if we treated people with primary health issues the way we treated people with mental illness, not only would there be this plethora of civil lawsuits, there would probably be indictments for gross negligence. And I don't understand why I'm the angriest person in the room. It's outrageous. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had to take my dog to the vet for something really minor on a Saturday. It was all fine. Took him home. Monday morning, first thing, at 8.30, the phone rang. It was the veterinarian's office. They wanted to know how my dog was doing and if he needed anything else. We laugh. But do you know how many providers call people that leave their facility that are imminently dangerous to self or others get a call the next day to see if they need any help? We discharge people in the middle of the night, floridly psychotic. We don't give them the services they need. They act out and then we punish them by arresting them when we never gave them the services that we know that would work to help them recover. I'm sure many of you have seen that great ad by Cancer Centers of America. It's beautiful. God forbid you get cancer. We are going to get you the best doctor in the world and the best diagnosis, and we're going to get you the best treatment, and we're going to help you with your housing and your transportation and your mental health. And it's the exact opposite of what we do for people with serious mental illnesses in this country. If you'd indulge me for a moment, I want to read from an article that I reviewed that I think is very telling. The past few years have seen an increasing amount of interest manifested in mental health and psychiatry. The existing procedures treats people with mental illnesses as criminals instead of people who are ill. Booking a person with mental illness at a police department or jail is unnecessary and undesirable. Police officers should be replaced by trained representatives of hospitals to effect the transfer of patients from their homes to hospitals or from one hospital to another. All laws concerning mental illness should be integrated to eliminate inefficiency and duplication. In the past, psychiatry has suffered because of its isolation from general medicine. Integrating psychiatry into the general practice of medicine, it is in line with m modern trends of medical education and hospital practice. The article goes on and talks about the need of community education, how we need to educate parents and children and teachers and doctors and judges and jurists and clergy, employers, employees, and the general and public. And these are just a few of the comments and recommendations that were published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in January of 1939. 79 years ago. And so it is so sad and tragic that when it comes to developing and funding an appropriate mental health system, we have actually lost ground and are doing things almost worse than when we did 79 years ago. I don't have a lot of time to give you the whole legal history on how we got here. Suffice to know, most of you probably understand this. When the country was first founded until the early 1800s, we incarcerated people with mental illnesses. As a result of the American activist Dorothea Dix and her adoption of the French movement known as moral treatment, we began to take people from jails to hospitals. And we built these nice, small, 120-bed asylums. 
Unfortunately, the states began to consolidate these asylums into these massive houses of horror, similar to the one I saw 42 years ago, leading to court rulings and to the deinstitutionalization. We failed to adequately fund President Kennedy's Community Mental Health Act. We combine this with the war on drugs, the war on crime, sentencing guidelines, massive cuts to HUD, and the perfect storm was created, and we started to reincarcerate people once again into the criminal justice system. The impact has been staggering. In 1955, there were some 560,000 people in state psychiatric hospitals and about 5,000 people with mental illnesses in jails and prisons. Today, we have less than 40,000 hospital beds. However, last year, 1.5 million people and about 2 million incidents mental illnesses went to jail. In fact, one of the great ironies, if we never shut the hospitals down, and I'm not advocating that, I am not a big believer of long-term institutionaliz institutionalization, but just to put this in context, if we never shut down the hospitals and they continue to grow the way that they, our population grew, we'd have about 1.5 million people in state hospitals today. It's almost the exact number of people that were arrested in this country last year with mental illnesses. So there are two and sad and horrible ironies to this. Number one is we never deinstitutionalized. What we did, in fact, is we allowed for the transfer of responsibility for people with mental illnesses from these really horrible, crappy state hospitals to these really horrible, crappy jails, except in some ways we've made it worse. Because now, not only do they have to deal and live with the stigma of having a serious mental illness, now they have to deal with the stigma of having a mental illness and a criminal record, making it more difficult to get housing, making it more difficult to get employment, and more likely they're going to meet new friends that teach them great new skills on how to steal and commit other crimes. And maybe the second and the sadder cruel irony is that we have come full circle. 200 years have now passed, and jails are once again the primary place for people with mental illnesses in this country. It is one of the only areas in civil rights we have lost ground over the last 200 years, and the consequences could not be any more clear. We have seen homelessness increase. We have seen police injuries increase. We have seen police shootings of people with mental illnesses increase. We have wasted critical, critical tax dollars, and in many ways we have made mental illness a crime in this country. Last year in my own state of Florida, the police initiated more involuntary exams under our Baker Act than the total number of arrests that they made for robbery, burglary, and grand theft auto combined. It's over 100,000 cases. And if this wasn't disturbing enough, just consider the fiscal impact that the existing system is having on our state and local budgets. So when we started our mental health project 18 years ago, we realized that we didn't necessarily need to help everybody. What we really needed to figure out is who were the highest utilizers. And I guess this is the good news and the bad news of this story. We don't have to fix the entire system. We just have to start targeting better to go after the people with the higher acuity levels that are killing the entire system. And what I'm about to tell you fully illustrates that. So we have a wonderful institution in Florida called the Florida Mental Health Institute at the University of South Florida. And they're one of the only institutions in the U.S. that have these wonderful blended data sets. And so they can actually tell a community who the highest utilizers of criminal justice and mental health services are in the community. And so when we began the project, we said, hey, we need to wrap our arms around the people that are accessing the most in our system. And how do we do that? So we took the names of thousands of people that had been arrested in Miami-Dade over a five-year period that we knew had an indication of a serious mental illness. And we thought, hey, if we could at least maybe narrow this down to 1,000 people, that would be a really great start for us to figure out how we should attack this problem. You know, why don't we use a population health model instead of a criminal justice model? What a thought. And so we send them all this data, and I wait and wait and wait, and finally a letter arrives, not even an email. And it's pretty thin, kind of like my college applications. <laughs> I got a little nervous. I'm thinking, wow, this is interesting. And I open it up, and there's one piece of paper. And on this one piece of paper are the names of 97 people, primarily men, primarily diagnosed with a schizoaffective schizophrenia type disorder, primarily homeless, and primarily co-occurring, who over a five-year period 
were arrested 2,200 times. They spent 27,000 days in that horrible jail, 13,000 days at a crisis unit or psychiatric related facility, and minimally cost taxpayers $13.7 million. And we got absolutely nothing for it. We joke, but it's true. It would have been cheaper and more effective to have sent them to Harvard. They would have had a shot at an education. They would have had housing, and they probably would have done a lot better than what we ended up doing with them. This is the absurdity of our mental health system in America. And we blame them. Second area that needs really serious scrutiny is our entire competency restoration system. So in some states, when you get charged with a felony or misdemeanor and you are incompetent to stand trial, you are required to be restored so you can be tried. A noble and wonderful judicial concept because under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, everyone is entitled to a fair trial. And maybe 50, 60 years ago when very few people with mental illnesses were in the criminal justice system, it made some sense but we're using the same system today that was established 50 years ago, and now we have almost two million arrests a year. And because judges don't have a lot of options, we abuse the heck out of the competency restoration system because we think it's the only way to help people get treatment. So this is the way it works in my state. If you're charged with a felony, whether it's a minor felony, nonviolent felony, or serious felony, if you are incompetent to stand trial, we send you to a facility to restore you so that you can be tried. Makes perfect sense. Well, Florida spends almost 22% of its entire adult mental health budget now on restoring between 2,500 and 3,000 people for competency. Now, maybe that would be fine if those 2,500 people committed heinous offenses and needed to go to prison. But for 70% of the people that we spend all this money on, three things happen to them. The charges are dropped because the witnesses disappear. Often these are homeless type offenses. They get credit for time served for the period they're at the facility, or they get probation. And under all three scenarios, they generally leave the courthouse without any access to care after we have spent almost 25% of my state's entire mental health budget. And you have to understand competency restoration is an entitlement. You have to have a right to a fair trial so the state has to pay for the service. But guess what? The state doesn't have to pay for mental health services in the community for people that aren't charged with crimes. So what do most states do? They take the money from the community system to pay for this massive growth in our forensic system to restore people so we can kick them about out on the street without any access to care. You know what it is? It's the definition of insanity, where we keep doing the same thing again and again, and we expect a different outcome. It is now costing the states billions of dollars for this foolhardy system instead of using some sense and diverting people into treatment as opposed to restoring to release. And the third most ridiculous thing going on is in the prison system. My state's a classic example. Like most states, our prison population has finally started to level out. We're leveling out at about 100,000 people in the state of Florida in prison but our mental health population is continuously going up like this. So during the same period we've seen a leveling out, we've seen a 156% increase in the number of people going to prison in Florida with serious mental illnesses. And because they're not committing very serious offenses, the average stay for someone with mental illness in Florida's prisons is only two and a half to four years. It's growing so fast right now that if we don't do something to curb it, Florida will need to build 10 new prisons over the next 10 years just to house its mental health population. The cost to build and operate 10 prisons in Florida over 10 years is about two and a half billion dollars. So that we can hold people two and a half to four years and send them right back to an inadequate, under-resourced, fragmented community mental health system so they can go back to prison 
within a year. There is something terribly wrong with a society that is willing to spend more money to incarcerate people that are ill than to treat them. So where do we start? Because what makes all this so difficult is it has to be done county by county. There is no federal switch on this. There's not even a state switch on this. The way we set up our community mental health systems in the United States is that it is a community by community health system. And if you've seen one community mental health system, you've seen one community mental health system, and there are about 3,300 of them with different standards of care, with different abilities, without any type of federal model on what this should look like. And so we're all doing our own thing, swimming in a sea of sewer. There are no national guidelines. There are no national practices. There are no protocols on how we should be dealing with this population. And it makes it very, very difficult. And so what we did after this horrible incident involving the psychiatrist as we decided that we would not continue to do things as usual. And so while more and more judges are becoming involved in the issue, the reality is that none of us can fix this alone. It's going to take a collaboration between all the traditional and non-traditional stakeholders, such as law enforcement, the state attorney, the courts, the public defender, corrections, our local Department of Children and Families, our local governments, our providers, administrators, family members, and consumers. And so for many years in my own community, there clearly was a recognition that our mental health system was an embarrassment and a disaster and needed a total overhaul. And so we began in June of 2000 looking at a way to change it. And I guess one of the best things about being a judge is that when you invite people to meetings, they come, <laughs> even if they don't want to be there. And I know that's very true because I told you my age corresponds to deinstitutionalization. And at one point, I was the acting chief of the county court division in Miami-Dade in the public defender's office. And all of a sudden, in one year, we had all these clients with mental illnesses that we never had before. Because as it turned out, the hospital down this road from us had closed. And so I naively um, sent a letter out to all the important traditional and non-traditional stakeholders in my community as a public defender, asking them to come to a meeting to see what we can do to fix this problem. And I show up, and I'm all excited, and this is the God's honest truth. Nobody showed up. Not only did nobody show up to my meeting, they didn't even have the decency to call and say they weren't coming up. I actually went back and asked my assistant if she sent the letters out. Well, two years later, to my shock and awe, I was appointed to the bench. I had the situation with the psychiatrist. I took the same letter, I put it on my new stationery, and they showed up early. And what we did is I understood at that point what the definition of an expert is. It's someone that lives 15 miles outside your jurisdiction. And we were fortunate enough to work with Policy Research Associates, also known as the Gain Center in New York, where they sent us three experts from Seattle, which is far away as you could get from Miami, so I had the best expert in the world. And someone from Maryland and Philadelphia, including Patty Griffith, who is one of the authors of what's known as the Sequential Intercept Model. In the first half day of this summit, and it was a two-day meeting, we literally mapped out on walls how the community mental health system intersected with our criminal justice system. And very quickly, what we learned is it didn't that we were embarrassingly dysfunctional. I remember this moment in the meeting where we all stopped and looked at each other and had to ask, who is more sick? People with a serious diagnosable illness or us so-called policy types who have designed a system to fail. In fact, the guy from Seattle who, who was the creator of this mapping process told us a wonderful story they did in Seattle. They took a group of people like me and you in Seattle and they took them to a local park. And they took their shoes and their purses, their wallets and their IDs and they said, hey, you have a mental health disorder. And tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, you need to be in court. At 10 o'clock, you need to go see your probation officer. At noon, you need to go see your psychiatrist. And 2 o'clock, you need to pick up your medication. Good luck. And if you think about it, what we did is we designed a system for people that aren't sick, have IDs, transportation, 
and the ability to get around. We did not design a system of care for people who are horribly sick and have no means or ability to do much at this point in their life. And then we're surprised they don't show up ever or don't follow our rules. So we knew we needed to change our trajectory. We knew we needed to do a better job. So we mapped out the system. We produced the goals with what they were doing in Seattle. We actually produced a written cooperative agreement, actually making people sign a document how they were going to change what they were doing and how we were going to improve our system. We created the 11th Judicial Circuit Criminal Mental Health Project. We began to collect data. I started to give tours of that horrible jail to all my elected officials, threatened to leave them there if they didn't help me. <laughs> it's good to be judge. And after a bunch of task force, three grand jury reports, we developed a goal with a simple message that reads, diversion and linkages to comprehensive care makes jail the last resort. We started with a two-part approach. If I were to do it again, it would be a three-part approach. The first approach was to look at how we could reduce the flow into our system. Why were the police arresting so many people? We looked around the country, and clearly the best system for law enforcement that we found was something that was developed in Memphis called Crisis Intervention Team Policing. If you're not familiar with it, it's a 40-hour training program that teaches law enforcement officers how to identify people in crisis, how to de-escalate the situation, and where to take them as opposed to arresting them. Now, Memphis had one police department. I had 36. I remember vividly going to see the director of the Miami-Dade Department, which is our largest. We don't have a sheriff. We have a director. Same thing. And he was so condescending. So I got there, and I guess they don't really like civilians telling them how to do their job. So I went out to see him, and he's like, look, Judge, thanks for coming out. I felt like he was patting me on the head. He said, you know, we did an analysis, and last year we only had three mental health calls. We checked all the 911 tapes. Three. This is Miami-Dade County. We're the fourth largest county in the United States. I said, well, Chief, I, I, Director, I appreciate that, but, you know, these calls don't come in as a mental health call. They can come in as domestic violence, vagrancy, you name it. Well, thanks for coming. Well, at the same time, the police were shooting two people a month with serious mental illness in my community, and one a month was dying. And because of the video, you saw a grand jury was in panel to take a hard look at the system and literally unofficially indicted the police for not doing a better job. And overnight, they started to shift, and they have really become our heroes. We now have the largest trained squad in the United States of CIT officers. We have over 6,000 officers trained. We keep data on every single call my two largest departments make. That would be the city of Miami and Miami-Dade, which is between 60 and 70 percent of all the calls. Between 2010 through 2017, those two agencies alone handled 83,427. And by the way, now that they collect data, Miami-Dade has about 5,700 mental health calls a year, not three. But more impressively, out of the 83,427 calls, those two departments combined only arrested 149 people. Our police shootings almost stopped. Police injuries almost stopped. Injuries to people with mental illnesses almost stopped. And part of it is what we learned, which was one of the unexpected values of our project, is the impact that trauma has on law enforcement officers. I don't have to explain about the pituitary gland, the adrenaline, and cortisol to this group. But I read an article recently that law enforcement officers get six to nine times more cortisol a day than we do. They suffer from severe PTSD. PTSD, they are one of the worst professions to get help. In fact, last year, more law enforcement officers in this country died from suicide than in the line of duty. It explains from aside from having one of the highest suicide rates of any profession, they also have some of the highest divorce rates, domestic violence rates, and substance use rates because of their trauma. You also have a lot of returning vets going to departments that were traumatized to begin with and are getting re-traumatized as law enforcement officers. 
My CIT coordinator gets 150 calls a month from police officers for their own mental health issues. We had to set up a separate system of care because they won't go to their own agencies for help. And as a result of that, the amount of empathy that they have developed towards the people we're trying to help is enormous. And I think it explains part of the reason why they have become so great about not arresting. When we started our project, Dade County had 118,000 or so arrests a year. Because of the project right now, we are down to 56,000 arrests a year. Our jail audit dropped from about 7,200 to 4,000 because the second component of the project was a post-arrest diversion program. This isn't a mental health court. It's much bigger and more sophisticated. And don't let people tell you mental health courts are the answer. They are a small part of the answer. But what you really need is a structural change in the community and setting up systems of care so people don't come in. And when they do come in, we screen better and we get them out when appropriate. We changed the screening tools at our jail. You know, I have 67 counties in Florida. There are 67 different tools and assessments and diagnoses coming out of every single jail. We need standardization. We need research. We need to understand how to assess appropriately and figure out what people need. We changed the screening tool. And now, anybody that's identified as having a serious mental illness, they immediately see a psychiatrist. And if they're charged on a misdemeanor, instead of ordering these ridiculous evaluations so we could release people on misdemeanors, we have a professional certificate issued. And within three days of an arrest, if you have a serious mental illness, you're transferred to one of our crisis stabilization units. We have several in Miami because of our prevalence. I have both the private and public providers signing off on that agreement. We send them all over the community. And because they're on a criminal hold, we do not have to worry about the 72 hours under the civil and voluntary hospital laws. We reset the case for 14 days, which is what most of this population needs. I would hope that maybe one day you would look at the involuntary hospitalization laws. They don't really work very well. They're all over the place. They're 50 years old. They're based on old ideas in science. While most of this population does not need long-term institutionalization, they need a lot more than a few hours at a crisis unit. And so we reset them. They begin to stabilize. Members of my team go out and see them. They're all trained in motivational uh, techniques. We encourage them to go into our program. If they do, they are not resent back to jail. They go directly from the facility to the courtroom where one of my eight peer specialists who work for the court are waiting for them. I have eight peers. They are amazing. They are the secret sauce of our recipe. They are able to work with this population. We find them housing. We, find them, we bring them clothes. We bring them food. We have a car to transport them f directly from the courtroom to where they're going to be living. We help them reestablish relationships, which incentivizes them to want to get better. People are very naive about medications. People think they're going to be cured or they're going to come right back to their old self with a pill. They need a lot more. What we're finding is that so many people that come into our system have clinical depression on top of their mental illness. The system has just beaten the hell out of them so bad that by the time they get to us, medication is the last thing they care about. Getting better is the last thing they care about. They have just given up on life. And the peers help break through that and help them get better. Our recidivism rate of our misdemeanor population dropped from 72% to 20%. Worked so well that the state attorney allowed us to expand it to our felony nonviolent mental health population, which we do as well now. The felony program has already saved the county in the last five years, 68 years of jail bed days by getting people out, getting them treated, and keeping them from coming back. On Monday, we began the pre-construction of the first of its kind facility in the United States, a 180,000 square foot facility that will be a mental health diversion facility for the most acutely ill, those 97 who we have not been able to help. We have about an 80% success rate at this point. We're failing with the most acutely ill because the system's too fragmented. 
their baselines are too low, and there's no capacity anywhere in the United States for people that are that sick, short of a hospital, which they do not qualify for because they're not imminently dangerous to self or others. This will be a one-stop shop. It'll have a receiving facility, and the difference of this program is that if you're really sick and really difficult, you get to stay. If you're not, we'll send you to a traditional provider who can probably handle you. There'll be a crisis unit, a short-term residential facility, a day activity program run by people with mental illnesses to teach self-sufficiency. There will be a culinary supportive employment program to teach employment, so when people leave, they'll have employment. It'll be a medical home model, so that we'll have a primary health, dental, eye, tattoo removal. You'd be amazed what people in psychiasis can do with tattoos. Like, hell, it's really hard to get a job that way. We'll have a courtroom so that we can process civil and criminal cases. We'll have a living room model so that if they don't meet criteria, they can hang out and we can engage. There'll be trauma services. 92% of all the women in prison and jails in the United States with serious mental illnesses were sexually abused as children. Six, seven, eight years old. They suffer from the worst type of PTSD. Do our schools embrace them when they act out? Of course not. And so if I were to do this again, I would have had the school board involved. I would be teaching every teacher in the United States on how to identify kids that are showing signs and symptoms of serious mental illnesses. The American Psychiatric Association Foundation has a wonderful program called Typical or Troubled Question Mark. Teachers need to be taught. Every pediatrician in America should be screening for trauma for little kids. Why are we waiting for them to grow up into my system when we know that with early identification and intervention, people get better? Treatment works. There is such a gap from what you know and what is delivered on our streets. You would cry if you came to a community and saw what is actually done. We have to figure out how to bridge the gap. I'm pretty much out of time. I was going to go through the ISMAC 5. I saw that you had them up there. I would really hope that this organization would embrace all five areas and embrace the entire report. We have decided through work we've done over 18 years, there's 14 essential elements that a community needs for recovery, and all of them are pretty much embraced in the five categories that ISMAC, what a terrible name, is, is putting forward. They did a brilliant job, and I think their work needs to be heralded and supported and pushed, and then we have to figure out how to research that work make sure that there are best practices and systems of care that communities can use and have a standard by which to hold it against, which we don't today. Something that NIMH really needs to take a look on, figuring out those type of research models and methodologies that we can figure out what communities need. Because I am convinced by the work that we have done in our own community with very few and little resources, that if we can offer people access to care, if we can start applying a population health model instead of a criminal justice system model, we'll finally accomplish what the Supreme Court asked us to do when they ordered the deinstitutionalization of these terrible state hospitals. Thank you all very, very much.